versus the nominal rate of return. Why is that important, especially if you're getting close to retirement age? Marshall Clay with the Relsh Group joins us now with some of the answers. Good to see you this morning. Hey, good to see you. And we know this is related to inflation, but just give people a, a brief explanation of what you're talking about. Yeah, so we talked about inflation a lot over the last two or three years, and you and I were talking off camera. I was, I was, I've been posed this question a bunch over the last, you know, several months. They say, look, I can go to the bank and I can, I can get a, you know, four and a half to five percent, you know, risk-free nominal rate of return on my money. That that's good, right? On a savings account, yeah. Correct, and yeah. I have to say, well, it, it, it depends. It depends on your particular circumstance, but it, but it really depends on inflation. So, for example, when we're talking about real rates, real rates are adjusted for inflation, so they take inflation into account where nominal rates do not. So when that po person comes to me and says, I can generate a 45 to 5% nominal rate, I say, okay, well, what's inflation? So if you have a 5% nominal rate of return, but inflation is at 3%, yeah. okay, you've really only generated 2% rate of return, and that's before tax. So you add any tax into that, you're probably breaking even or maybe slightly ahead um, in, terms of, in terms of real rates. And we should say there we have some, we've had seen some fluctuating in the rate of inflation, but overall, everything is just costing more. That, that's right, and so, so we have seen some, some positive movement on, on, on this disinflationary front, but I think it's important for our viewers to remember the purpose of investing, and it's to generate a rate of return that helps you stay with or ahead of inflation okay. longer term right. and then ultimately when you retire you want to be able to maintain lifestyle and provide a stream of income for you for your entire sure. life so so how so how do we do that and I think for, for younger investors um, it, it's really a little bit easier because they can be more heavily tilted towards equities stocks real estate you know alternative so, assets oh those are so own assets yes like own, that yes own assets and then talk about what you mean by balanced approach with those liquid assets yes yeah, so I think certainly as you get closer to retirement you have have to play a little bit more defense. Even though bonds aren't as good with, with helping you stay ahead of inflation, you actually have to have those in your portfolio because they provide uh, short-term uh, income needs mm -hmm. and, and they provide a ballast to your portfolio. When we have these deflationary impulses that we see from time to time in the equity market, a lot of times it allows you to weather that storm and maybe buy more equities. But I think one of the biggest mistakes that I see you know, particularly pre-retirees and retirees making is that they don't focus any of their time and effort on the bond side. They always talk about stocks, okay. they want to focus all their effort there, but not all bonds are created equal. And if you look over the last like two to three years, mm -hmm. most retail investors just kind of blindly put themselves like all of their fixed income or bond side into these aggregate bond indexes. And if you look at the nominal rate of return on those over the last, they've been negative. You mm -hmm. add inflation, it's been even more negative. So just be careful when you're looking at the bond. Sounds side. like the message of they put in some protections and some Sometimes that includes bond protections as well for all your other investments. All right. That's right. We appreciate it. Marshall Clay from the Mouse Group. Thank you so much. Thank you.